History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 20. What is free will? January 28th, 1965. Adorno's notes for this lecture. The separation of outer and inner is generally naive, pre-critical, even though the distinction should be retained since it presents itself in primary experience, i.e. to the actually alienated, it should not be made absolute. The internal to be radicalized as external, actual human beings together with their interiorization themselves belong as actually existing to the external world to which they know themselves to be contrasted and counterpoised. Inner and outer, too, are dialectical categories. The outer, conversely mediated by the inner, never knowable as existing purely in itself. The critical scientific solution must be, the will has to be a, a constitutum, the unity of characteristics, whether of promptings, impulses, or decisions guided by reason, even though these decisions are determined by it. Thus, we should not hypostasize the will, and the same holds good for the freedom that depends on its existence. Its position is exactly the same as the Kantian thing in itself, as he himself says. The question of freedom is a pseudo-problem, because to pose it turns it into an independent problem as opposed to the phenomena it includes. This objection lacks rigor because it simply pushes the problem back from the superior concept to the things of which it is composed. That aside, difficulties in the concept of the regulative nature of phenomena of the will. A. Are there, in fact, irreducible impulses? Um, nothing is achieved with the abstract assertion of reducibility. It is purely regulative. What is needed is to carry through the business of making determinations, not simply to give assurances so that these determinations could be seen to be constitutive. B. Can reason interrupt causal sequences? Evidently, yes, but with the problem of the constitution of a second causal series of determinants. 1. On pseudo-problems in general. Changing function of the term, at one time enlightened. Scholasticism, angel's ladder. Nowadays, to prevent discussion of what is of interest, a form of prohibition on thinking. Concepts that are not clearly defined, semantic taboo. Question of freedom, of the will, as relevant as it is difficult to state clearly what the two, what the two terms mean. Hence, what a pseudo-problem means marks the beginning of reflection, not its end. Relevance obvious, justice plus punishment. The possibility of morality or ethics, this real interest not to be fobbed off with dismissive remarks about pseudo-problems. Two, however, however, philosophy may not simply bypass semantic criticism. Its theory must include a. the impossibility of pinning down freedom and will, b. the necessity of discussing them after all. Kant satisfied this requirement in a sense, um, in brackets give a, a brief account, but without fully resolving the conflict, it, sur it survives unanalyzed. Um, extract from Determinism, paraphrases of Kant. The talk about pseudo-problems was once inspired by the Enlightenment. This wish to prevent the flow of ideas from the unquestioned authority of dogmas, whose truth could not be adjudicated by the very philosophies to which it had been submitted. The perjurative overtones of this can still be discerned in the term scholasticism. In the meantime, pseudo-problems have ceased to be questions that defy rational judgment and rational interests. Nowadays, they are questions that make use of concepts that have not been clearly defined. A semantic taboo has become prevalent that stifles questions of substance by converting them into questions of meaning. A preemptive prior consideration expands into an embargo on the discussion of certain questions. What may or may not be reflected upon, however crucial it may be, is governed by rules modeled on the current methods in the exact sciences. Established procedures, the means are given priority over the sub substance, the goals of cognition for which they are supposed to exist. Disturbing experiences that impinge upon people prior to their articulation in language 
and that sometimes balk at being confined in unequivocal signs, are reprimanded, as if the difficulties encountered in expressing them were the fault purely of a lax, pre-scientific linguistic usage. The relevance of the question of whether there is free will is as great as the technical difficulty of stating clearly just what is meant by it. Since justice and punishment depend on this question, to say nothing of what the entire philosophical tradition has understood by morality and ethics, common sense refuses to accept that we are faced here by pseudo-problems. A self-righteous defense of tidy thinking responds by offering us stones instead of bread. Nevertheless, semantic criticism cannot simply be casually dismissed. The fact that a question is urgent does not mean we can compel an answer if no true answer is available. Even less can a fallible need, however desperate, show us where to look for one. It would scarcely be possible to state simply, in terms that are clair et distinct, just what will is and what freedom and the same common sense, what insists on these categories would be the first to argue that, if we could discover no existing will and no existing freedom, it would be a waste of time to consider whether the will is or is not free. We should not be concerned to reflect upon objects by judging their existence or non-existence, but by expanding their definition so as to allow both for the, for the impossibility of nailing them down, and also for the necessity of continuing to think them through. This is what is attempted under the conditions of Kant's transcendental idealism in the antinomy chapter of the Critique of Pure Reason and throughout extensive passages of the Critique of, Pro of Practical Reason. Although Kant does not entirely succeed in avoiding the dogmatic usage that he, like Hume, exposed in other traditional concepts, he settled the conflict between the world of phenomena, nature, and the intelligible world by by having recourse to an all too Solomonesque dichotomy. But even if freedom or the will cannot be said to be entities, then by analogy with some with simple pre dialectical epistemology, this does not prevent specific impulses or experiences from being synthesized by concepts. There may be no underlying thing like reality to correspond to these concepts, but they can nevertheless unify those impulses or experiences much as the Kantian object can synthesize its phenomena.